The 22nd of July was World Brain Day, which got us thinking. How does the study of the human brain help us unravel the mysteries of life? Going a step further, how can having a better understanding of the brain help us to combat debilitating diseases or treat mental illnesses? This is Julia Baker with the Oxford Comment. As neuroscience encompasses a vast array of other fields, such as biology, chemistry, psychology, medicine, sociology, and linguistics, we realized that we could have gone in a multitude of directions for today's episode. Our focus this episode is on human consciousness and how studying the neurological basis for human cognition can lead not only to better health, but a better understanding of human culture, language, and society as well. Our science correspondent, Victoria Sparkman, spoke with both of our guests today. First, we welcomed John Parrington, Associate Professor in Molecular and Cellular Pharmacology at the University of Oxford and Fellow at Worcester College, Oxford. He is the author of the newly published book, Mind Shift, How Culture Transformed the Human Brain, and a recent guest on our spin-off audio series, The Side Comment. I'm Victoria Sparkman, from the Oxford Comment Podcast, interviewing John Parrington on his book, Mind Shift Today. John, thank you so much for coming on to the Oxford Comment Podcast. We're excited to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Can you please introduce yourself a little bit to our audience and tell us about your recently published book? Yes, I'm John Parrington, so I'm an Associate Professor of Pharmacology in uh, Oxford University. And my main research area is cell signaling, so that's how signals within cells mediate important processes in the body. And I'm also a geneticist, so I look at how genes control those kind of functions. But I also write popular science books, and my first two books were first about the genome and all the kind of bits of the genome that we didn't really understand, the so-called junk DNA, it turned out to be quite important really. And then the second book was about new technologies like gene editing technology and optogenetics and these kind of technologies that are really taken off. So my new book, Mind Shift, is quite a departure in the sense it's about consciousness and obviously quite a big theme really, but it picks up on some of the same issues of how can we use molecular and cellular understanding to learn more about something like consciousness. Great, thank you so much. So according to your book and your research that you've done, can you tell us a little bit more, you make the claim that the human brain is very unique from other animals. Would you be able to expand on that a little bit for us? Yeah, I mean, to some extent, I think many people would agree there's something quite distinctive about human beings, but I think it's surprising how many people, for instance, in the neuroscience community, maybe don't see that uniqueness and, and distinctness the, the way I do. So, so I do believe that things happened in our evolution that have radically changed the human brain. And, and, and that has implications because although I, as a, an experimental scientist, I believe we can learn huge amounts from studying animals and, and the way their brains work. I do some, think there is something quite unique about the human being. And I think that language in particular plays an important role, but also what we can call cultural tools. So language is one of these, but there are many others like art, literature, music, all these different things that are quite, I think, quite unique to humanity that uh, affect the way our brains have evolved, both in evolution, but also how we develop as, as, as individuals in a human society. And I've been particularly influenced by a psychologist called Lev Vygotsky, who worked in Russia in the 20s and 30s. But I, I've really tried to take his, his interesting ideas about how the mind works and then bring them up to date with modern neuroscience and modern psychology. Wonderful. Thank you. Can you maybe um, expand a little bit on the sociocultural impacts, the more specific ones, like you mentioned language and arts and culture? Um, what would be some other of the major influences that has kind of shaped the human consciousness? So I think we do need to go back to our evolution to really understand why language in particular had a big role. I said it wasn't really just language. I mean, when, when we really started to diverge from the apes, it was essentially when we started to stand on two feet and use our hands through the things, and that meant we started to use tools. Now, obviously, there are other species that do use tools, but I would argue not in the systematic way that we do. So that interaction with nature through tools, I would argue, is one of our key characteristics that makes us really quite distinctive and the way we continually develop tools. Now, that interaction using tools to transform the world, but then working together as, as cooperative social beings, I would then say led to language and, and that then started to transform the brain. You know, since, since then, we've developed art, music, 
you know, obviously we have all these other technologies now where we're talking through the internet. I, I would say that in every generation, there's new technologies, new uh, cultural tools that, that have an impact on our brains and the way we think. Wonderful. John, more specifically, can you speak on the impact of just language on our human brain development? Yeah, I mean, I think really things started to change, as I said, once we started to use tools to transform the environment. I think that in itself was a major shift compared to other animals, other species. But I think it's when we started to talk to each other and develop a means to not just communicate, because the, the important thing about human language is it's not really just about communication. It's about the ability to be able to conceptualise, to talk about space and time, to talk about past, present and future, me versus you, you know, concepts like colour, things that we take for granted, really. But other animals, I would argue, just don't, just don't have that. And that affects the way that we think. And, and what Vygotsky said, so Vygotsky, as I say, was an influence on my book, said was that really words are, are like a tool. What We use tools to transform the environment around us. The words can be seen as a kind of an inner tool that transforms our minds. And another thinker I also draw on in the book, someone called Valentin Voloshinov, worked around the same time as Vygotsky. Both did, died tragically quite young, actually, in, in the kind of late 30s, in, in the 30s. Um, and he built on some of these ideas and, and saw language that inner speech as being a driver of, of consciousness. So there's, there's thought, there's inner speech, there's, lang there's outer language, external language, and the things are linked together. But the inner speech is important because that's where, I guess, thoughts come into being. That's where our kind of imagination, creativity can also really get, get going. And I think one of the important aspects of language being the thing that restructures our brain, both in evolution terms and also as we develop as individuals, is that is a social thing. So, so to some extent, our minds are social. You know, what how our minds develop is based on the kind of conversations, interactions we had with parents, peers, colleagues, whatever. And also, Voloshinov saw them the, the, in his speech itself as a kind of dialogue. So it's also open to influence. It can change. Ideas can change as, as environment changes. I've looked at social upheavals, evolutions, uh, you know, places in history where lots happened in history. And, and you can see some interesting signs there where ideas can twain, change quite radically. So what I've been trying to do in the book is to take that basic idea of the link between thought and language, but then link that to what we know about modern, modern neuroscience. And, and I think I've found some evidence that there are real structural cellular molecular change in the brain that show how that how language has transformed consciousness but we're still very much at an early stage really understanding that process i would say great so the treatment of mental illness is an area that many have a very vested interest in if not for themselves for a loved one who is affected and in your opinion how can researchers better incorporate these socio-cultural influences into their research to help develop treatments for or even just more of an understanding about mental illness? Yeah, that's a really important question, I think. I mean, for me, um, personally, it's a very important issue because I lost my sister to suicide after a severe depression and with other people in the family have died in unnatural ways, probably linked to mental disorder. From a professional point of view, I would like to understand why it is that for the species that so, seems to be so in control of, of, of things and able to manipulate the world around us, <laughs> why so many people succumb to mental disorders. And what I've tried to do in the book is to take this framework of thinking about how language and other cultural tools transform the brain and then think, how does that then relate to mental disorder? And I've tried, to, I think, to steer a path between what I see as two wrong ways of looking at mental disorder. On, on the one hand, there is this idea that everything's just down to the genes, it's just biology. You see that to some extent, I mean, this is a caricature to some extent, but you do see that kind of view to some extent in some areas of psychiatry. And then on, on the other hand, you, you have, for instance, the uh, spokesperson for the British Psychological Society who said recently that biology isn't really, it doesn't matter at all, really. It's all about um, trauma in earlier life and society and the environment. So I personally think those are two what I would call reductions in trying to reduce mental disorder and human behaviour in general, I guess, to either biology or, or the environment. And instead of trying to find a way that, the, you know, brings in both nature and nurture. But I don't think that's a simple issue because I don't think there's just nature here and nurture there. The two things interact and influence each other in a very sophisticated, dynamic way. And that's the sort of thing I've explored in the book. 
both in terms of what it means to be human, but also in terms of why is it that something can succumb to these disorders. Thank you. So more specifically, touching on those factors that you just mentioned, what does having a better understanding of the human consciousness mean for people with autism spectrum disorder specifically? I know that's something that was of interest when we were kind of looking into your book a bit more. Yeah, I, mean, I think for all of these so-called disorders, I mean, even the term disorder is a loaded term, so people prefer distress and talk, talk about illness. I mean, so we could be talking about schizophrenia, depression, autism spectrum disorder. My son was diagnosed fairly recently with ADHD. Uh, I think it's very important to recognise that although these terms can be useful in helping us to try and understand what might be different, what might be um, potentially a real problem in some of those disorders, it is a term, it is a label. And to some extent, I think we're looking at quite potentially quite heterogeneous conditions. So that this acknowledged to an extent with autism, it's autism spectrum disorder. And, but I think it's probably true, actually, many of the other things. There's probably no such thing as schizophrenia as a single entity or depression. And it's I think it's important to recognise that. Now, coming on to autism in, in particular, I do think there's been a, a welcome changing attitude um, over recent years in seeing some of the positive aspects of autism. And I you know, teach people with ADHD and, and autism in Oxford University. There's some very clearly some very highly performing autistic individuals in all sorts of aspects of life. And I think that's a positive thing, seeing this the sort of positive side of so-called disorders. Um, I do think we have to be careful because I also have friends, a, a friend who has a very severely disabled autistic son a son who will probably never, ever be able to interact. Uh, so he'll never be able to really live an independent in, individual in society. And, and I think it's, it's important, although we, we really acknowledge the positive contributions that people with autism spectrum disorder you know, can, 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 can give to society. Greta Thunberg, a good example, someone who's, I think, radicalised that whole idea of thinking about the environment, but, you know, she's, she's autistic. But I think it's important we, don't, we also recognise that some people with these conditions can be quite severely disabled and maybe need our help in, in quite different ways. And I think it's a delicate balance, getting that kind of balance on the one hand of acknowledging the positive aspects, but not missing the fact that some people, these are really debilitating conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. On a slightly different note with this, uh, this year's World Brain Day was focused around multiple sclerosis, which is, for those who don't know or are not aware, a disease primarily associated with the loss of muscle function, but it is caused by the debilitation of the nervous system that currently doesn't have a cure. Is there um, any crossover that you believe that studying the brain could combat MS and similar diseases as well? I think one thing that's interesting about MS is, is on the one hand, we we're starting to recognize some of its core features, you know, so, so a key thing is that myelin, which is this insulating material that we have on nerves, is, 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 becomes defective in, in, in MS. We do know it seems to be an autoimmune disease. So we know lots about it. And yet, again, I think it shows how complex some of these conditions are. I mean, in, in that sense, MS is, is mainly associated with more like muscle function, you know, uh, more like the physical aspects of being human. But actually, there are there is a crossover. We, 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 there are some mental effects of MS as well. I think it shows that the more we learn about the molecular and cellular base of a disorder, it can lead us to better understanding. Unfortunately, that doesn't always translate into a cure. So at the moment, we still don't have a cure for MS, despite knowing lots more about it than we used to. So, uh, you know, the genetics of it, that there are some links with genes, uh, gene differences, and that's interesting. But like schizophrenia, like depression, like autism spectrum disorder, the, the genetic links there seem to be complex ones. Now, I think one thing that's a common theme, actually, that's emerging in a number of different areas of neuroscience is the role of immunity, the role of inflammation. So there's, there's obviously a link there with MS and autoimmunity. But we're also starting to recognise that in schizophrenia and depression, there seems to be a role for inflammation, when, when it, well, basically when inflammation goes wrong. And I think that's kind of going back to the question we asked earlier on about mental disorders. And I was saying, well, on the one hand, there's you know, nature and then there's nurture, but actually the two intertwined. There is increasing evidence that trauma, and that can include, you know, psychological trauma as well as physical trauma, can have an impact in terms of inflammation in the brain. Now, how that then leads to, say, schizophrenia versus depression is quite different disorders, we, we would think. 
is the complex bit and the bit we're still trying to understand. But I think there's a common theme here, uh, which is that you know immunity, inflammation, uh, all play a role. And I think there's a topical angle here, which is obviously that you know, COVID, uh, on the one hand, it's a, it's a virus that, that attacks the attacks the respiratory system. But maybe if we want to understand some of these cases of people with with symptoms after being infected with COVID, we might find there's some interesting links there with immunity as well. And who knows, there may also be effects on the nervous system. So I think all of this is showing that the body and the mind and the brain are not separate, and the mind and the body are not separate. That there's quite a link between these two these different things, really, which is on the one hand fascinating, but also shows just how complex the whole thing is. Great, thank you so much. So John, as we kind of wrap up our interview here, what would be a key message that you would like readers to take away from your book when they read it? Well, I think one thing is that we are really quite unique. I mean, to some extent, this is going against a trend that we've had, uh, I think, for quite important and valid reasons for the last few centuries. So Copernicus put us in our place by showing actually, rather than being the centre of the universe, it's actually the Earth that goes around the sun, and the sun itself is just one star amongst many. Darwin showed that far from being unique in a biological sense, uh, in a biblical sense, actually human beings are incredibly related to other species on the planet, and we're all the product of evolution. So to some extent, I'm going against that trend by saying, by claiming that there's something quite unique about human beings. But I, I think it's important to acknowledge it, because I, I don't think it's an accident that we are talking over the internet, we're having these complex, hopefully useful conversations, because I, I don't see any sign that any other species does this. And I think it's very important to recognise this and then think, well, why is this? Now, to some extent, rather than thinking, well, that makes us, you know, we can do what we want, we can just, you know, emboss other species around and do whatever we want. We've also got to then look at the fact that for all our great gifts, uh, our ability to, to think, to conceptualise, we seem to be heading for disaster in many ways in terms of the, the climate crisis, that kind of thing. So in the last chapter of the book, I look at ways which we as individuals can try and make sense of what we see around us in society, some of the more negative aspects of society, and, and try and be fulfilled and live meaningful lives and happy lives. And, and, and that can be despite the kind of trauma that we sometimes have to suffer. And I, I've had this in my own family, you know, suicide and that kind of thing. But also look more on, on a broader sense of how we as a species can really get to grips with our uniqueness, but using that in a very positive but, but sustainable way. Because I think most people would agree that these days that for all civilizations, great technological and cultural achievements, we seem to be living in a very unethical, unsustainable fashion. You know, we, we, we've got a, a runaway greenhouse effect. It, it really seems to be something that we're not handling at all well. So I, I look essentially about how the ways we might work together as this unique species and as a, a species that the only species that can really interact in this complex conceptual way to try and find ways to live happily but also ethically and sustainably in the future maybe that means a, a big rethink about you know the way we live our lives both as individuals and as a species but i think that the hope is that having these great gifts gives us that potential and power to do exactly that Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming and agreeing to be interviewed today on the podcast. We've really enjoyed having you and this has been very interesting. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Sid. For our second interview, we spoke with Anil Seth, Professor of Cognitive and Computational Neuroscience and founding co-director of the Sackler Center for Consciousness Science at the University of Sussex. He is the editor-in-chief of the open access journal, Neuroscience of Consciousness. Well, Anil, thank you so much for coming on to the Oxford Comment today. We're really excited to have you on the podcast to talk more about the Neuroscience of Consciousness journal. Can you maybe introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit more about the scope of the journal? Sure. Thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk with you. So I'm Anil Seth. I am the chief editor of this Oxford journal, the Neuroscience of Consciousness. And I work very closely with a deputy editor, Jakob Hochwi, who's based in Monash in Melbourne. I'm, I'm based at Sussex University in the UK. Uh, we've been editing this journal for about six years now. It launched in 2015. The journal is in, it's called The Neuroscience of Consciousness, and, and that's pretty much what it's about. It's about the brain basis of conscious experience. My own background is as a as a neuroscientist, but one who's worked in a variety of different disciplines, ranging from artificial intelligence to philosophy to psychology to neuroscience. And I mention that because I think that's actually quite key. 
Although the journalist called the neuroscience of consciousness, the attempt to understand consciousness scientifically is intrinsically a multidisciplinary enterprise. It's not within the remit of any single discipline, although some are more important than others, or some are more strongly represented than others, I should say. But for such a big question, after all, the nature of consciousness has been one of the animating questions of thinkers for thousands of years. It just doesn't fit neatly into any single discipline. So we have to take account of perspectives from maths, physics, philosophy, uh, psychology, cognitive science, neuroscience, of course, and psychiatry, neurology for the clinical perspective as well. There are many different, many different perspectives that are helping us gain traction on one of these old problems. The journal does emphasize the neuroscientific contributions to understanding this, but quite loosely, what, what we like to do is just make sure that the kinds of research that we publish have neuroscientific relevance. They have to be understood in terms of this relationship, this, this unknown, uh, and some would say unknowable, ultimately, relationship between the messy wetware inside your skull and this subjective world of first-person conscious experience that we all enjoy. Hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was very, very fascinating. And when we were researching the journal, especially on that point that you were talking about with the different disciplines, philosophy kind of seemed to come up a lot with um, this journal kind of bridging a gap, I guess we could say, between the fields of neuroscience and more philosophy and the other disciplines like you mentioned. Um, would you agree to that more philosophical lean on this? And if so, how does that set you guys apart? I would certainly agree with the philosophical lean, as you put it, but I don't really think we're bridging a gap because I don't really think there was much of a gap there to begin with. Consciousness has been a deeply philosophical issue, of course. It was, in fact, primarily a philosophical issue. When I started my own uh, academic career as an undergraduate and as a PhD student, consciousness was not really well thought of in the in psychology and neuroscience, at least not in the places I was at. It was still considered rather fringe, um, perhaps a little bit disreputable to be overly interested in consciousness. There was this idea that science was not up to the job of studying it. It wasn't the kind of thing because of its intrinsic subjective nature that could be studied through the standard means of science. Of course, I, I disagree with that. And the journal is partly there to, <laughs> to push back against that assumption. But that assumption has received a lot of pushback anyway. And part of that pushback has been to recognize this deep integration between philosophy and uh, the natural sciences, psychology in particular, and also neuroscience. Another bit of relevant context here is that for decades now, there's, well, just probably about over two decades, there's been an association uh, called the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness, the ASSC. And this has been, for me anyway, it's really been my academic home for the last at least 15 or to nearly 20 years. And I think actually, yeah, maybe 18 years that I've been going to this meeting. And this society was set up specifically to encourage a cross-fertilization between philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience uh, to try and make headway, to bring legitimacy to the scientific goal of understanding consciousness and help these disciplines talk to each other. And the, the philosophical perspective is absolutely crucial, but you're not going to find empirical answers within philosophy. So, mm. and, and by the same token, empirical psychology and neuroscience is essential in un unraveling detailed mechanisms, but it can go severely awry unless it's guided uh, and inspired and constrained in some cases by a philosophical perspective when you have something as conceptually up for grabs and potentially confusing as consciousness. So a, a, a rich dialogue between the two is, is needed. And for a while, you're right, that wasn't happening so much, but it has been happening now for, for quite a while. And the journal was set up to kind of capitalize and really embody that interaction uh, in the journal format. In fact, Neuroscience of Consciousness is the official partner journal for the ASSC. So we have a very, very close relationship uh, trying to just provide a channel 
for the publication of research that is empirically and rigorously grounded and shaped by also rigorous philosophy. So mm -hmm. what we're not so interested in is random or, or maybe even not random, but wild speculation, for instance, about alternative kinds of physics or metaphysics that might uh, bring consciousness into existence. We want to we want to remain as far as we can close to ongoing work in cognitive science and neuroscience laboratories, but emphasizing uh, the relevance to consciousness. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So this episode on neuroscience was primarily inspired by World Brain Day, which this year was focused on multiple sclerosis. And this led us to wonder about the implications of deeper study in this area for autism spectrum disorders and to a further extent, mental illnesses. Anil, what do you think that having a better understanding of human consciousness means for individuals with autism spectrum disorders or mental illnesses? That's a great question. And I think it, it underlines another important motivation for the neuroscience of consciousness. You know, on the one hand, we have its status as one of the grand mysteries that we would all like to understand purely for its own sake. We all want to know, you know how mm -hmm. come we have conscious experiences and you know, what, what happens when we have an experience of the, of the visually seeing a sunset or tasting a red wine, something like that. Um, how does this happen when all that's going on inside our brains is just communication among neurons? But there's also very practical motivations for an enriched understanding of the biology of consciousness. And this is to be found primarily or predominantly in, in medicine, whether it's mental illnesses, which can be productively understood mm -hmm. as disorders of conscious experience. And when people suffer from, I'm not so much thinking of autism here because I'm, I'm very reluctant to characterize autism as a, as a mental illness. It isn't a mental illness. I think that's very important to say, uh, but there are you know, other conditions which are, I think, usefully thought of as mental illnesses, such as schizophrenia. And for instance, schizophrenia is defined in large part by people having unusual and distressing experiences. And there's also altered behaviors, but those seem to be associated with the kinds of experiences that, that people have, hallucinations, thoughts in their heads disorders of, ex of agency where they feel that they do things that they don't feel in control of and, and so on. So psychiatry for decades has been largely moving along the pathway of classifying uh, psychiatric conditions in terms of their symptoms. And in fact, the, the Bible for psychiatry, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, is really just a list of clusters of symptoms. There is, and I'm not a psychiatrist, but I think probably most psychiatrists would uh, would agree that there is not a very detailed mechanistic understanding of the basis of these symptoms. Mm -hmm. you know, by analogy, it, it's, it's the difference between diagnosing somebody as having a fever and understanding what is causing that fever, whether it's COVID-19 or something else. Mm -hmm. And when you understand what's causing the symptoms, you can then deal with it much better. You don't give people paracetamol, you give them a COVID vaccine or an antibiotic, something like that. Now in psychiatry, we typically don't have the equivalent of vaccines or antibiotics. There are ways of dealing with symptoms, but what we really want is to understand and, and therefore address, intervene in the mechanism. And so this is where the neuroscience of consciousness really comes in, because another way to think of it is what are the mechanisms in the brain and body that are responsible for the specific kinds of unusual experiences that characterize uh, mental illness and, and other conditions? And when we can understand that, then I think we can progress these areas of medicine forward. And of course, this is not just happening in, in, in this journal. I mean, there's a whole field now called computational psychiatry, which is exactly trying to do this. But the specific angle that we have is always to focus on the experiential dimension rather than the behavioral or some other some other feature we want we want to try to understand what the experiences are like and why they are uh, the way they are to try and bring that back front and center wonderful in the specific case of autism I and mean, you did mention that so i should say i mean this is 
this is not a mental illness. You know, there's there's right. a lot of disagreement about exactly what it is. You know, is it a spectrum? Is it a variety of different kinds of conditions? Uh, it's certainly a it's certainly something that needs to be more deeply understood. I think mean, that we can all agree about that. And here, I think there are some interesting angles from a neuroscience of consciousness perspective as well, because I think there's a lot of you know, one widely held perspective on autism is that it's about theory of mind and that it primarily manifests in social interactions and in difficulties people have with social interactions. But it's increasingly apparent that there are other unusual features or distinctive features of autism as well that may be more basic and have to do with perceptual processing of the world and maybe a hypersensitivity uh, to sensory information. So trying to understand those aspects of conditions like autism, I think, will really help us get a handle on what's underlying some of the more normally talked about uh, aspects of autism, such as social uh, social interactions and theory of mind. And here we, again, we get back to a very basic question. What is the world like from the perspective of somebody with autism uh, in terms of their first person experience? Mm -hmm. And how do we understand that in terms of brain mechanisms? Wonderful. Is there anything that has been recently published by Neuroscience of Consciousness that would address maybe some of these things? There's well, that you a guys lot. aren't clinical journal in scope, but no, we're not a clinical journal, but we do we do solicit papers mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that that address these issues, especially from the perspective that I've just been describing. In fact, we we don't have that many. I was I was looking back through what we've published in, over the last couple of years, so I may I haven't exhaustively gone through our table of contents, um, but my impression is that. Uh, it's it's a it's an area we potentially like to grow a little bit more into. So most of the stuff we publish still tends to be, and this is this is not a criticism, it's just an observation. It tends to be basic science of of healthy, usually probably undergraduate psychology students in the lab doing mm -hmm. doing their experiments or modeling and theoretical papers. We have a few clinical papers. Uh, some of the clinical work we've published is best characterized as neurology rather than mm. psychiatry. So here we're looking at more global disorders of consciousness that follow brain damage, how to diagnose residual consciousness following large severe brain damage and so on. We do publish a lot of stuff that is very relevant to this question of psychiatry and how, how perception works and individual differences in perception and so on. But in the future, indeed, I would like to to see our journal move a little bit more strongly into this area of, of clinical potential. Wonderful. Great. So Neuroscience of Consciousness has a special issue out on consciousness science and its theories. We were really interested in discussing what led your team to decide on this as a topic, and maybe could you tell us about some of the articles that have been published in the issue? Indeed, we do have a special issue in progress at the moment on theories of consciousness, and this is being led by uh, a guest editor, Thomas Andrian, in conjunction with Jakob Hochia, deputy editor, and, and others. Uh, so I'm personally not so involved in it, which is actually really nice for me to take a, sure. to not, not be involved, <laughs> let, it, let it see it develop. And it's been very successful. We've had a lot of submissions on theories of consciousness and very high quality submissions too. Most of them are still going through the the review process uh, at the moment. Um, the reason we chose theories of consciousness as a topic is because over the last four or five years, there's been a real blossoming in the theoretical landscape of, of consciousness science. Mm. So before that, there was an acceleration of empirical work. People were publishing a lot of papers uh, about things like the neural correlates of consciousness. So this would be you know, what parts of the brain light up when you consciously see something versus not, or what happens in the brain when you lose consciousness under anesthesia and so on. But mm -hmm. there weren't that many theories to try and put these empirical findings into context. There are a few, uh, but now there are, there are sort of more, but also the theories, the prominent theories that are out there have been fleshed out in more detail. Mm -hmm. And it seemed that the time was right to focus on the theory specifically, how they relate to each other, uh, what new opportunities there might be in distinguishing between theories, uh, 
-hmm. in uniting the theories. They may actually in some ways be the same theory sometimes because they, they come out of different traditions. Some theories sure. emerge from a more philosophical tradition, others from a more uh, neuroscience tradition. And it turns out this was this was indeed quite a timely initiative. There's there's another initiative in the field at the moment, led by the Templeton World Charity Foundation, which is setting up adversarial collaboration. So they're funding research in multi-institution teams where the goal is specifically to distinguish between two competing theories of consciousness. Now, typically what you find in the literature not only in, in this area, but I think quite generally, is that there's a strong confirmation bias. People like to publish evidence in favor of the theory they already like, mm -hmm. uh, rather than evidence against their theory, right. uh, or, or typically don't even work on a theory they don't really like. So you don't tend to see much much evidence. You know, uh, there's, there's very few direct comparisons or direct rebuttals of theory. So this is uh, I think a, an admirable approach of funding research that's trying to at least force proponents of different theories to think more clearly about how they might uh, distinguish their theories from others, uh, what might undermine them, and give a bit more a bit more sharpness and precision to this landscape of of theories of consciousness. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this special issue turns out. The way it works, we're publishing the papers as as they process through. Mm -hmm the system. I think actually there's a, a couple of key things I forgot to mention about the journal at, at sure. the top, which is that it's a purely online journal. So we we have issues, but we publish papers as they get accepted. Mm -hmm. And this can be beneficial for authors because their paper appears basically as soon as it's uh, accepted and uh, you don't have to wait for specific issues to, to turn up. And it's open access. And I think that is absolutely key. So there are no paywalls. Anybody can read a published paper. You don't have to subscribe. You can sign up to get notifications of papers as they appear, but it's completely free from the perspective of the reader. And we do try to keep the author costs very low. So here's where it's uh, it's been a really good to work with Oxford University Press, actually, because they are keen to make sure that we don't charge ridiculous amounts, which which some journals do, and and you know, it's it's not free to publish. Although you know, if you can't pay, we'll try to find a way. But right. we try to keep the author publication charge pretty low. So I'm very keen for the journal as a whole to exemplify best practice in what we broadly call open science these days. Anil, can you please tell us a little bit more about open science as an initiative? There is a general movement in, especially in psychology, but in many other fields now to embrace what we broadly think of as open science. So I mentioned already one important dimension of open science, which is open access, uh, mm -hmm. that papers should be freely available to read. I think that's that's super important for, for equity in, in the availability of scientific knowledge. Along with open access, there's also open data and open materials. So as far as possible, we encourage authors to make their data publicly available in a suitable format. So typically not in a way that the participants can be identified is the is the usual thing there. But then there's another, um, and I think especially relevant for journals, there's another area which I'm very excited about, which is called registered reports. And so you know, typically what you do or what has been going on, certainly in, in my career, in the way papers get published is that you, you have an idea, you, you try and get some money, do some work, you get some results, you write it up, and then you submit your paper only after you've basically written it and done everything. And this is fine, but it leads to a sort of bias where you tell the story about your data after you've collected it in order to make it the best story you possibly can. This is a sort of natural human tendency. Uh, but that's not really how science should work. You know, you should have your hypothesis, collect the data, and then make your interpretation, you know, not, not post hoc, but you should have set out in advance how you your hypothesis will turn out given the data. So there are all sorts of initiatives now to encourage that kind of practice. There's pre-registration, which is this idea that authors 
just upload in some publicly available place what they're going to do and how they're going to analyze it and what they expect to happen. But the, the full version of that, I think going the whole way down that line, is something called registered reports, where basically you submit a paper to a journal, and you can do this for neuroscience of consciousness, and you submit the paper which describes what you're going to do before you've done it. You, you lay out the question, you describe your methods, you describe how your analysis is going to work, and then that gets reviewed. And you often have a back and forth about that, but once that gets accepted, you then go and collect the data. And we as the journal guarantee to publish the paper, no matter how the data turn out. And this mm -hmm. takes away the bias for only publishing positive results. And it's very important to make space for publishing negative results too, results that don't turn out as you want them, or that in fact don't say anything. So long as the approach, the methods are rigorous and the question interesting, you know, it still it can't just be anything, right? But it shouldn't all depend on whether your data support the story that you first set out with. So registered reports is a very interesting initiative that didn't come out of our journal. It's, it's pioneered by one of my colleagues called Chris Chambers. But a number of journals are now allowing registered reports. And so we have we have a dedicated registered reports editor, Zoltan Dienes, who's expert in open science. And we've had two or three submissions now. And, and the process has been very, very encouraging, very pleasing, because people really engage and make sure it may it also has the, the the benefit that the experiments that get done have had the benefit of advice before they actually get done from from external people so it can improve the quality of the science that gets done too rather than people doing a, an experiment and then trying to and then there's holes found in it and then okay you, you make the best of it why not figure out the possible problems in advance now this isn't suitable for everything you can't really do registered reports for let's say a clinical case study uh, but it can be applied in many cases where we would just normally do experiments on on students or on, on healthy control uh, participants. So that's something that I hope we'll see a lot more of both in the neuroscience of consciousness and in academic publishing more broadly. Thank you so much. That's great. So Anil, do you have any other work coming out that you would like for us to discuss here? Well, our lab has been kind of shut down throughout the pandemic, as as many mm. have. So we, we're 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 publishing some stuff, um, doing a lot of work on time perception at the moment, which I'm very interested in. Personally, I also have a a trade book, so a book for the interested general public on consciousness, coming out with Faber in the UK and and Penguin in America, called Being You: A New Science of Consciousness, and that will be available in September in the UK and October in the US and Canada. Uh, so that might be of interest to people interested in the neuroscience of consciousness. Great. That sounds very exciting. Once again, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast today. We've really enjoyed hearing from you on this topic and look forward to reading your book when it comes out. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot. We want to thank our guests, Anil Seth, Editor-in-Chief of Neuroscience of Consciousness, and John Parrington, author of MindShift. Please check out our show notes on the OUP blog for excerpts from their work, along with a suggested reading list that provides even more context for understanding human consciousness, mental illness, multiple sclerosis, and the biology of the brain. New episodes of the Oxford Comment will premiere on the last Tuesday of each month. Be sure to follow OUP Academic on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and YouTube to stay up to date on upcoming podcast episodes. While you're at it, please do subscribe to the Oxford Comment wherever you regularly listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher. Lastly, we want to thank the crew of the Oxford Comment for their assistance on today's episode. Episode 63 was produced by Stephen Philippi and Victoria Sparkman. This is Julia Baker. Thank you for listening.